So in this video, we're going to take a look at imprinting in humans. So let's take a look at our slideshow. Okay, so here we are. Humans in imprinting. <clears throat> Can you think of any ways in which humans are flexible as young people, but um, fixed once we become adults? In other words, can you think of examples of a critical period of imprinting in humans? This is kind of tricky. Um, perhaps certain rituals or cultural behaviors where you learn them as children and they're pretty fixed once adults. Uh, perhaps accents fall into this category. Uh, as a youth, you can learn languages. First of all, you learn them really quickly, but you learn them with no accent. But when you reach the age of 13, 14, 15, 16, something around then, uh, at, and learn a new language, you will always carry with you some type of um, accent. So language acquisition with respect to accents is probably an example of this kind of critical period imprinting. As I have a great story about this, I have. My mom came from the Netherlands in 1950. She arrived when she was eight. She had six siblings, uh, ranging in age from like 17 to uh, five, I believe. And the it was kind of interesting. These are my uncles and aunts. And what I found was my Aunt Jenny and my Uncle Garrett and my Uncle Herb all had accents. They were all over 13 when they arrived in the States and learned English. But my Uncle Jack and my mom and my Aunt Kelly all, and my, my other aunt died, um, all did not have accents. There was kind of a cutoff where, and that cutoff is real and it's, and it's evident in um, in the literature that it's somewhere around age 13, 14, 15, typically, where individuals can no longer learn the language without an accent versus individuals who can learn the language without an accent. So language acquisition might be in one of those. Perhaps there's sexual imprinting, um, imprinting for certain foods. Let's take a look. So I want to give you some specific examples of research done on humans and imprinting. And one of them is the development of food preferences. And this is kind of all over um, the internet. And it's also kind of makes parents probably feel bad. Don't um, hold this against anyone. But uh, it turns out that one's early experiences, particularly in utero and as infants, um, up till 18 months will bias the acceptance of particular flavors. Haha. <laughs> In other words, babies' tastes are influenced by, um, babies' tastes are influenced um, and imprinted, you know, at a very early age, and that will have an impact on um, an adult tastes. That's kind of crazy. So researchers have shown that mom's dietary flavors can be transmitted to the amniotic fluid and to the breast milk. And so, ex and they found that experiences with some flavors like carrots or anise, like licorice, um, garlic, for example, um, at birth or as young infants by breast milk, um, they actually prefer these flavors as adults years later. Crazy. Um, breastfed babies experience more flavors in general than babies who are fed by formula. And what that translates into as um, older children, and certainly as older children, is that they're more willing to try new foods. They're more exploratory, if you will, in their food selections. Okay. Another good example of this research shows that fruit and vegetable consumption in eight-year-olds is predicted by breastfeeding duration. The longer you breastfeed, the more likely that the eight-year-olds are to, to branch out and try new foods, but also to food-related experiences early in childhood. 
So during that critical period when the baby is born, somewhere between maybe six and 18 months, what you're exposed to plays a role in your preferences later as an older child. And this is where kind of the guilt sets in. Oh no, I didn't give my kid the right kinds of foods. And the internet is filled with um, kind of this shaming technique, right? You need to give your children organic fruits and vegetables. Don't give them baby food in a jar. Don't give them formula. You need to give them everything that uh, is is good and whole because that's going to imprint them forever. And you're like, no, I can't do this. I'm I'm not perfect. Um, but it is interesting to me uh, that um, what mom eats during breastfeeding, what mom um, or mom and dad feed their child, and this is another one, what the parents' diets and preferences are, what what baby sees mom eating. So if you sit down and eat a banana with your baby, they're more likely to accept that food preference and have that food preference later. Oh, crazy, huh? I have some anecdotes about this. Um, when my mom was pregnant with me, she said that she ate like a bushel of pears in the fall before I was born. And I absolutely love pears. And maybe that's no surprise. Uh, my daughter Faith is now 12, but she, um, in utero, likely didn't get a lot of diversity. She's adopted from Ethiopia, and then she was raised on formula from two weeks old to the time we uh, adopted her at 10 or 11, actually till 12 months old, and, and we were feeding her other foods then. But um, she does not do well at all with novel foods, and she still doesn't. And perhaps that's not because she's just picky, but because she's picky for a reason. <laughs> she imprinted on kind of bland foods of formula and other things that were available to her. We don't know. It's kind of interesting. It's a huge area of research, and it's one that's really kind of, like I said, a little bit of a, a shaming type of research comes out of it when you look on the internet and see all sorts of, um, yeah, kind of subtle shaming going on. <laughs> Humans and imprinting. Try this one. Sexual imprinting. Uh, is there any evidence that we are, that we sexually imprint? Are we likely to choose mates who are similar to their opposite sex parents, like those male zebra finches? Well, the research says yes. Oh, that's kind of scary. So here are some, um, here, there's some evidence for these things. Age. Daughters of older men tend to choose older partners. So there's this correlation. Here's another one. Children of mixed race marriages are more likely to marry someone of the same race as their opposite sex parent. That's interesting. And what about hair and eye color? Well, a recent internet study had internet participants answer survey questions about the hair and eye color of themselves, their partners, and their family. They had close to um, 700 individuals participate in this. And the question was, do people prefer partners with similar hair and eye color to their parents or to their opposite sexed parents? And the researchers threw out red-haired individuals. I guess there just weren't enough of them to consider it. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's disappointing because most of my kids are red hair. Anyway, this is what they found. <clears throat> so they were kind of looking actually for assortative mating, it's called, when you mate with somebody who's kind of like you, or in this case, kind of like your parents. Kind of scary, isn't it? The results go something like this. Men and women... Well, let me just write this down. I'm going to read my results. They're a little bit different here. The, for women, paternal hair color and eye color was significantly related to partner hair color. Maternal hair color was not. So women tend to pick uh, and marry um, people who have similarities to their dad. For men... 
both maternal and paternal hair color was significantly positively related to the partner's hair color. Maternal eye color was significantly positively related to eye color, but paternal wasn't. So eye color from, um, so men, pay, uh, men seem to pick partners that have eye color similar to their mom. Hey, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? What's going on here? Okay, assortative mating could be happening that's due, I mean, it could be real that assortative mating is happening here, but it's due to imprinting-like behavior. That's the mechanism that seems that um, humans are imprinting on their opposite-sex parent to a large extent and choosing a partner that's sort of like them. It could be that these data are pretty biased you know, this was a survey on the internet in which you simply reported the hair color of your dad, your mom, your eye color. This is stuff that um, it might be easy to, uh, uh, to mess up on or to um, report in a biased way. Oh, everybody has brown hair. It's kind of brown. You know, something like that. It could be that it's happening. And there might be adaptive value. There might be a function for assortative mating. Hmm. Can we think of a function for assortative mating? Hmm. Or for this kind of mating where you would choose to mate with somebody that matches your opposite sex parent in looks? This is hard. It's possible that by choosing kind of sameness, you are more genetically compatible. So I've seen some literature that suggests that, you know, it might be important for your immune system. But this also could be very much functionless, a byproduct of another process, a consequence of the visual system um, or of the reward system where when you see something familiar, oh, I see a face that looks like I grew up with, that rewards you, that makes you feel good. And so you're more likely to choose that, even though there's no function for choosing uh, a partner that looks like your dad or your mom. It might just be a byproduct of this reward system where, ah, a stimuli that, stimuli that look, look like something I'm familiar with are good. Okay. Much like, you know, um, ducks, you know, see something that, that they grew up with, that's a good thing, sexual imprinting. Okay. All right, I think that's the uh, last example. Oh, I have one more question I forgot about. What similarities and differences does the example of sexual imprinting on eye and hair color in humans have with sexual imprinting in finches? Hmm, that's a good question. I'll have you... Uh, think about that particular question. Uh, I think that's right. Oh, well, here's one more thing that is worth thinking about. Do we learn to avoid mating with close kin by a negative imprinting-like process? So is there some sort of negative imprinting process? Like learn to avoid anything that you grew up with, so to speak. People you shared your childhood with, uh, somehow that makes you averse to mating with them as adults. Is that possible? Yeah, I think it possibly is. Um, that's one mechanism by which we, by which animals could learn their close kin. They, any, any, anybody that's around me growing up is probably related to me and I should avoid mating with them because there seems to be functionality or um, uh, this seems to be adaptive to avoid mating with your close kin. Mating with your close kin leads to offspring, leads to lower reproductive success, basically. So if there's some sort of mechanism that you could learn in some sort of imprinting way that um, don't mate with don't mate with in individuals that grow up close to you because they might be your kin. That's very possible that a mechanism like that happens in animals and possibly in humans. What's the mechanism that's responsible for incest avoidance? I don't know. I don't know about the neural mechanism, but it could be an imprinting, 
process, an imprinting-like process that happens during a critical window. You grow up with these people around you, you tend not to mate with them. And that's really true. The kids that you grew up with in the neighborhood that were your best friends, those are the ones that you're, you're not going to think about mating with them. Those are just your friends. Um, your siblings, same thing. Anyway, probably happens in the animal world as well. That's the end of imprinting and this lecture. Thanks so much.